The city-state of Sparta began as a small village. Life was very different here than in the rest of Greece. The Spartans were fierce, proud, and capable warriors. No great works of art came out of Sparta, but the Spartans were tough, and the Greeks admired strength. Sparta was in the south-central region of Greece, in an area known as the Peloponnesus, the area in which the Dorians settled during the Dark Age. By 500 BCE, it had become the greatest military power in all of Greece. The biggest change in Sparta's history, though, came around 700 BCE, when the Spartans, looking for fertile land to support their growing population, conquered a group of people living near them in Messenia. The Spartans enslaved the Messenians, whom they called Helots, and made the Messenians farm all the land for them. They treated the Helots very badly, often beating them and whipping them, or even killing them for no reason, and not giving them enough food. Spartan men, now that they didn't have to work anymore to get food, spent all their time training for war. The Spartan society was changed by the lawgiver Lycurgus. He had traveled throughout the Mediterranean world, visiting countries, studying their civilizations, history, and government constitutions. He returned to Sparta with the constitution he had prepared. When his laws were accepted, he made Spartans swear that they would not be changed until he returned, and he left once again. He never came back, making sure that his laws would not change. Even when he died, he asked his body to be burned and the remains be scattered in the wind. Lycurgus thus did not permit even his dead body to return. Spartan life was governed by the principles of discipline, self-denial, and simplicity. The Spartans viewed themselves as the true inheritors of the Greek tradition. They did not surround themselves with luxuries, expensive foods, or opportunities for leisure. The life of the Spartans seemed to hark back to a more basic way of life. Every Spartan was a servant of the state. The individual lived and died for the state. Their way of life was designed to serve the state from their childhood to the age of 60 and onwards, either in the army or as part of the government. The combination of this philosophy, the education of Spartan males, and the disciplined maintenance of a standing army gave the Spartans the ability which made its civilization unique. Spartan society was divided into three main classes. At the top were the equals, the native Spartans who could trace their ancestry back to the original inhabitants of the city. The equals served in the army and were the only people who enjoyed the full political and legal rights of the state. Below the equals were the perwisi, or dwellers around or about. These were foreign people who served as a kind of buffer population between the Spartans and the Helots. They were the artisans, craftsmen, and merchants in Spartan society. Trade and commerce were the responsibility of the Perwisi, as the Spartan citizens were not allowed to trade. Because of this vital function, the Perwisi were accorded a great deal of freedom, far greater than, those, than that of the Helots. At the bottom of Spartan society, of course, were the Helots. Spartan government was an odd affair. At the very top of the hierarchy was a small group of five ephors, or overseers. For all practical purposes, the ephorate governed Sparta. For these five men led the council, ran the military, ran the education system, ran the infant selection system, and had veto power over everything coming out of the council or the assembly. They even had power to depose a king. However, they needed powerful divine proof 
in the form of omens or oracles to exercise this power. Whenever a king left the city to lead the army into battle, two ephors went with him to supervise his conduct and report back to the other three and to initiate legal proceedings if necessary. The authority of the ephors meant the monarchy could never become overly powerful. Then came the monarchy, a dual one. Two kings held office at the same time. According to the Greek historian Herodotus, it is likely the dual monarchy was decided on as a compromise between the two leading tribes of Dorians. The Spartan crown was not necessarily passed on from father to son. It could be put passed on to the eldest male relative born during the previous king's reign. Below the monarchy was a council, the Jerusia, which was composed of the two kings plus 28 nobles, all of whom were over 60, that is, retired from the military. This council of elders debated and set laws and governed foreign policy and was also the supreme criminal court. The Spartan citizens selected the council and could even veto council proposals. This strange combination of offices means that the Spartan government, described in modern terms, was a democratic, aristocratic, monarchical oligarchy. The Spartans tried to become the strongest people in Greece. As soon as a child was born in Sparta, the mother would wash it with wine in order to make sure that it was strong. Later it was brought by his father to the ephors, who inspected it carefully and decided whether it was deformed or weak. If so, they left it on the hillside of Mount Tegetus, threw it in a chasm off the mount, or took it away to become a slave. At the age of seven, every male Spartan was sent to a military and athletic school, the Agoge. These schools taught toughness, discipline, endurance of severe pain, and survival skills. Young men were drilled in gymnastics, running, jumping, throwing of spear and discus, and also taught to, taught to endure pain and hardship, hunger, thirst, cold, fatigue, and lack of sleep. They were walking without shoes, bathed at the cold waters of the river, and were dressed winter and summer with the same loincloth, which the state gave them once a year. They did not use blankets and slept on top of straw and reeds. Their main meal was black bean broth, but they were encouraged to steal food to compensate for their meager, meager portions that they were given. However, if they were caught, they were severely punished. At the age of 18, members of the Agoge, now considered fully-fledged warriors and citizens of Sparta, were subjected to a harsh system of selection to pick out those who would become officers, members of the Royal Guard, and even future members of the Spartan Council. Some of these formed the Cryptea, or Special Operations Unit, who were charged with keeping the Helots thoroughly under control. At the age of 20, after 13 years of training, the Spartan became a soldier. The Spartan soldier spent his life with his fellow soldiers. He lived in barracks and ate all his meal, meals with fellow soldiers. He also married, but did not live with his wife. Only at the age of 30 did the Spartan become an equal and was allowed to live in his own house with his own family, although he continued to serve in the military. But the family still ate together in a communal mess with all fellow soldiers and their families. They were allowed to live with their families after this up to the age of 60, when their military service was ended. Spartan women had more freedom than the women of other Greek city-states. 
While women did not go through military training, they were required to be educated along similar lines. The Spartans were the only Greeks to take seriously the education of women. This was not, however, an academic education. It was a physical education which could be grueling. Infant girls were also exposed to die if they were judged to be weak. They were later subject to physical and gymnastics training. This education also involved teaching women that their lives should be dedicated to the state. When Spartan women sent their men into battle, they told the men to come home with their shields or on them. If the men brought their shields home with them, that meant they won the battle. Dead warriors were carried home on their shields. In most Greek city-states, women were required to stay indoors at all times. Spartan women, however, were free to move about and had an unusual amount of domestic freedom because their husbands did not live at home. The Spartans believed new ideas would weaken their way of life. Because of this, they tried to prevent change. When the people of other Greek city-states began to use coins as money, for example, the Spartans kept using iron rods dipped in vinegar to make it brittle and worthless elsewhere. While other city-states developed literature and art and built up business and trade and improved their standard of living, the Spartans remained a poor farming society that depended on the labor of slaves. Sparta prided itself not on art, learning, or splendid buildings, but on its valiant men who served their city-state in the place of wall or in walls of bricks. No luxury was allowed, even in the use of words. They spoke shortly and to the point, in the manner that has come to be called Laconic, from Laconia, the district of which Sparta was a part. Sparta's prowess naturally brought rivalry with Athens, the leader of the northern city-states, and for a time, all of Greece.